This is Dune Talk, a DuneNewsNet.com production. Join us now for the latest Dune news, reactions, and lively discussions. Hello, all. Happy New Year. Hope you've had a nice ho holiday period. We're back today to talk Dune with a recurring, uh, returning special guest. Um, so this month, Kara uh, Kennedy, uh, you may also know her as uh, the Dune Scholar, has published her new book, uh, Women's Agency in the Dune Universe, Tracing Women's li Liberation Through Science Fiction. Uh, so this uh, book covers in great detail the portrayal of women's characters, uh, focusing on the Bene Gesserit across all six of the books in Frank Herbert's Dune Saga. Uh, so Kara, welcome back to the show. And uh, first of all, congratulations on your new book. Um, I'm happy to have you on onto the book and talk uh, all about uh, Dune. Uh, so let me first give you the chance to introduce yourself for people who maybe didn't see the, the other show you're on, like uh, just uh, yeah, tell a bit about yourself. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Marcus. Thanks for having me back on. So I have been studying Dune for a long time. So this book is the culmination of several years of research. And I originally started studying Dune um, during undergrad, during my honors project, and I focused on Jessica. And then I went on to do a master's degree in English, and I expanded and looked at the Bene Gesserit as a whole and a few more of the female characters just in the first book. And I always wanted to look at all six of the original Dune series. And so when I went on to do my PhD, that for me was a chance to expand looking at the Bene Gesserit and how they change across the six books. And also I wanted to contextualize it. So look at what was going on in history at the same time. Um, so I came to New Zealand to do my PhD. So I'm still located in New Zealand and um, I'm still studying Dune. I'm working on a second book. Um, it's a more general guide to Dune. So I spent a lot of time thinking about Dune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when we had you on the, on the show the, the, the last time, several people had, had asked about, yo, I'd really, really love to read the, the, the doctoral uh, thesis. And so basically this book is basically taking that, that thesis and bringing it to publication. Did you actually do revisions, add stuff to it? Uh, so it, it went through the peer review process. So I did have to make some changes and there's a few things, mostly there's a few things that have been added, but it's the, the, main, the main content is from the, the thesis. There's just a little bit of contextualization and adding a little bit of information that had come out since I finished the PhD. Great. And the answer to those people is yes, you can you can read it now. It's it's available in, in hardcover, and we'll include uh, links in the description. And there's an article that we posted on on the site that gives more uh, more description about the contents. Um, so what I wanted to do is 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 open. I just wanted to take the the preface, like read a couple of lines because I thought that was uh, really interesting how how you opened the piece. Um, so uh, you started. Uh, they've been there the whole time neglected, misjudged, disregarded. The extraordinary women of the Bene Gesserit sisterhood in Frank Herbert's Dune series deserved more. This book is a step towards giving them the scholarly focus their characters ought to have. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's a opening that, that really draws, uh, drew me in when I was reading those, those first chapters. Uh, so what I wanted to ask you, so we know that Dune is a foundational text, you know, it's uh, considered one of the best-selling uh, science fiction books, uh, yet as you went into in, in great detail, like there hasn't been as much uh, scholarly um, analysis when it comes to the women characters, when it comes to the to Bene Gesserit, like, and I know you, you went into like some of the thoughts about that, so overall, why do you think that that is, why do you think it's been neglected, as you put it? Yeah, this is something I think about a lot. Um... I think part of it is they are not as science fictional as uh, some other characters in other science fiction. So they, to me, they seem more realistic. They're, they have special abilities, but they are based and grounded more in the real world and taking a few steps ahead. And so they don't quite seem as as different perhaps than we might be expecting in a science fiction novel. Um, but I think also, and Herbert has a tendency to do this with a lot of things, he's very subtle and he can be very um, understated in 
the kind of themes and the kind of ideas and the messages that he wants readers to get. So he he has his, his surface layer, which is the hero's journey and the adventure story, which entertains us. But underneath that are all the different layers of the politics and the religion and the mysticism. And so I think for some reason, people have looked at the Bene Gesserit and they've just looked at that surface level and they've said, well, since they're, they're not the kings and emperors themselves, nothing to see here, let's move on. And so what I tried to do is look, look underneath, look at the surf, look underneath that surface level and see, well, hey, what are they actually doing? What are their skills? What makes them different than other female characters in other science fiction? And I think also what I've come to study more is there's a lot of Eastern and Taoist elements in their order. So if you're coming from a Western background, we have a tendency to look for strength and leadership in, in very narrow ways, you know, like a lone male hero perhaps, or, you know, a lone, a lone presidential figure or prime minister. And we don't necessarily accept that there's other ways that people can be influential that are perhaps not what we're expecting, but but also still like strong and active in their own ways. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but and the, the, another aspect is there were a couple people that wrote very short articles in the 80s that were very dismissive. And I think those have kind of tainted that area since then because other people will then look at those and cite them and, and, and build off of that rather than taking a different path. So I'm really hoping to, to change the narrative and to give people something new to think about, even if they disagree with me, they have to kind of have to engage with, you know, that the Bene Gesserit have more going on than they've been given credit for and that Herbert's been cre given credit for. Uh, one of the things that I, I think a lot about is, uh, you know, even some of the people who have, uh, you know, read read the Dune book and like that I've been friends with a long time ago, and I, I know that they've, they've read the book, they, they like never went on to like read the rest of the this, this series, you know, like they, they took Dune as a standalone story, they maybe watched, watched the, movie, the original like movie they've mentioned 1984 and you know they, they really enjoyed the book but for some reason or, or other they, they never continued with the series uh, do you believe that that's also a factor when it comes to the study of the book that people maybe like focus too much on the first book and don't continue beyond that yeah i think a lot even the people that do read past often will end at children or the under god emperor like in my experience most people have not read the fifth and sixth books which is kind of a shame because that's that's where there's a whole nother group of women that come in that fight the Bene Gesserit. Um, and I think that's really interesting when we look at what was happening in the eighties, like why did Herbert suddenly take this turn to focus so much on female characters in, in his final two books. But, but I think even if people only read the first book, because Jessica is such a strong character and such a prominent character, we get a lot of information about the Bene Gesserit through her. So even if you only read the first book, if you take her as an example of what the Bene Gesserit can do, again, very understated, but I think it is there if you if you pay attention to what's going on. One of the things that you wanted to approach in your book was um, setting the study, taking into account the historical context of when the book was written, like influences on, on Frank Herbert. Uh, so what, one of the themes that you talked uh, uh, about is the um, um, uh, advent of uh, second wave uh, feminism. Like, can you tell like briefly to or like our readers who are maybe not familiar with that, like what that entailed and, and how that influenced uh, Dune and what sort of connections uh, we see with that? Very simplified form. Um, feminism is often divided into waves just for simplicity. So first wave is generally considered to be when women were trying to get the right to vote or get suffrage. So this is usually like 1800s, turn of the century. Um, a lot of countries gave women the vote around the um, World War One. And so second wave is considered to be uh, generally starting in the 1960s and really flourishing in the 1970s. And this is after World War II, uh, a lot of women were had been working in factories, had been supporting the war effort, uh, were shoved, especially in the US, shoved back into the home and told to be happy with being wives and mothers. And so there was pushback against this idea that women were getting more education and yet they weren't really able to do a lot with it. And there was a lot of 
um, discrimination and stereotyping happening in, in larger society. So the second wave is considered to be when women, they had the right to vote now, but actually using um, collective action, working together and trying to fight against things like discrimination, trying to get reproductive rights and just more general um, gaining leadership positions, gain, pretty much gaining access to the places that they hadn't yet gained access to. And so, and there was also, I mean, the Catholic Church was also seeing reformation happening, um, which we don't hear a lot about in terms of second wave movement, but um, nuns and women in the Catholic Church were also agitating for more recognition for women within religion. And so part of what I find really interesting is that this, this movement was really happening late 60s, and Herbert was writing and researching late 50s and early 60s. So uh, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique came out in 1963, which is the same time that Herbert's um, Dunes first came out in the magazine. So I actually argue that in some ways he's anticipating, he's ahead of what would become a massive cultural movement that would spread from the US and the UK across the world in terms of um, women's rights. Yeah, to see that uh, Herbert was, was ahead of his time in, the, in many things, like when you took, look about the if, if environmentalism, like a lot of the political uh, things that he, he talked about. Um, one of the other aspects that you, you talked in, into the book was the uh, positioning uh, Dune within the new new wave of science fiction literature. Can you talk a little about about there again? Again, what what that means and why why Dune was uh, was relevant uh, for that? Sim simplifying, so not all science fiction can be neatly categorized, but in general, in the scholarship, we'll divide science fiction into groupings. And so um, before 1960, you might hear it called golden age science fiction. So like Isaac Asimov, Heinlein, those are the stories that really started getting science fiction popular. And then what happened in the 1960s, again, with, with the cultural and social changes happening in larger society, this, this will be reflected in literature. The new wave is considered to be um, a group of science fiction writers started being more experimental. They started pushing the boundaries. They started including more risque things like sexuality and kind of taboo topics um, in society. And so this was experimentation within the genre and then um, in the 70s, you get feminist science fiction, which is related to that. It's really, really taking science fiction in, in new directions now. And so Herbert is really on the edge of, of both of these, right? So if we read Dune, we can see there's elements of traditional science fiction and you know, looking at the science, trying to make it believable, but there's also a lot of experimentation in terms of the um, drug culture, mysticism, and pushing the boundaries. And so I, I believe Dune is sitting kind of as a bridge builder between those different types of science fiction. And I think, and one thing, one, one area where it hasn't been recognized in terms of new wave is looking at the experimentation with the female characters. So I'm, I'm trying to say that he was doing experimentation. It's not super obvious, but it's there. And we really should recognize that as being part of what makes his science fiction not as traditional as it might seem on the surface. So you mentioned that um, uh, in, in the first chapter that arguably the, the most crucial overarching idea of second wave feminism and one that is key to analysis of the Dune series is that women should have the right uh, to control their own bodies. Uh, so can you uh, tie that back into the, the book of Dune? So like how does Dune represent this? So Dune is a low, low technological society because of the Butlerian Jihad. And so it's not just the Bene Gesserit, but you look at most of the characters have a lot of skill with the body, right? They're either fighters or, you know, they have mental processing skills or they have prescience so they can see into the future. And um, that really, there's also a lot of concentration on the mind, especially with Paul, but there's a lot of emphasis on what the human body can do and what it might be able to do if it had some extra help, like for example, through the spice, right? If we could just develop ourselves, we might be able to push the human body past what, what, we, what we felt possible, right? And this is something that humans are always interested in doing. We're always trying to push the boundaries. 
you know, live longer, be healthier, you know, reduce aging, um, get more advanced skills. So what I do is I, I take that, that focus on the body or on the skilled body that, that Herbert does in June. And then I really look at how does that translate to the women and then tying that in with, with the feminist angle is, well, women in the real world were really fighting for control of their body. How does how do the Bene Gesserit have control over their body? And actually, they have a lot of control over the body. They have arguably the most control of any other group in their body. Like every group has special abilities, but they kind of have all of them and extra ones because they're women. They also have control over the reproduction and having children. So that's really the focus that I chose to take, rather than looking at women, what women are doing in terms of leadership or you know those more obvious roles. I really focused on actually, do they have control over the body? And if they do, that's a really amazing thing that we should be celebrating. And uh, so you, you broke the book down into different chapters that are looking at basically the different abilities in a way of the, the Bene Gesserit. Can you explain how, how you decided to do that breakdown? Yeah, so that was uh, probably one of the most difficult things about, um, about writing the book is how, how do you, uh, disentangle all of the different themes and things that Herbert writes in Dune and, and separate them out into different chapters um, because they're so interwoven, it's really difficult. Um, so I've, I've managed to pick a grouping, you know, you could choose other groupings as well, but um, I started with looking at the prana and the mind and the body kind of um, abilities that everything is based on. So I thought that was really the foundation of their skills is that prana bindu, um, control over every nerve and muscle. And then from there, I looked at different aspects of the body. So I looked at the reproductive body, pregnancy and motherhood. And then I looked at uh, uh, voices. So this includes the voice, it includes truth saying. Um, and I also squeezed in there looking at the epigraphs so like Princess Arulon's got epigraphs at the beginning of every chapter. So that's not technically a voice, but you know, it's, it's, it's her voice coming through to us as readers. And then I looked at education and memory. So that's trying to piece together the clues about what did the Bene Gesserit teach in their schools? Like we only get really kind of little snippets here and there of, of what they teach. And then uh, the ancestral memory that they get once they go through the spice agony. And then the final um, area I looked at was sexuality. So what are they doing with the sexual body, sexual desire? You know, how do they control men or how do they interact with men in terms of sexuality? So those are the, the five main areas that I came up with to look at, but there definitely is crossover between them. And uh, you also compared uh, the Ben Jedra to, to other factions. Uh... So for example, the, the Mentats and then later later to other female factions. So what was your approach uh, there? So doing comparisons is really um, beneficial when you're doing literary analysis because it gives you something to kind of work off of, right? So I can study the Bene Gesserit alone, but it's really when um, Herbert puts other characters kind of up against them that you can notice the contrast and notice differences. So um, the men, well, in, we, in the first book, we only get the two men tats, um, Thufer and Peter, but I found it interesting that the men tats are all about logic, right? They're all about processing and, and reasoning, but um, Thufer is actually wrong about a lot of the things that he comes up with, you know, thinking Jessica's the traitor, you know, which he thinks until the end of the book, he still thinks this. And if you, if you notice when Herbert's kind of talking about the Mentats, um, there's, there's a critique in there of this idea that you could just base everything off of facts and information, right? Because the Harkonnen used that very um, susceptibility of the Mentats to feed this misinformation to the Atreides household. Um, and so what I found interesting is when we compare the Bene Gesserit, um, we, we see Jessica doing her own kind of sort of semi-mentat processing logical um, and children of Dune when she's with Faradine, like she rolls information through her mind. And so the Bene Gesserit have a little bit of that logical processing that the mentats do, but they don't solely rely on it. And so I think when we compare them with each other, the Bene Gesserit, Herbert is telling us, have more of a balanced view. Like they, they accept logic as valuable, but they don't 
overemphasize it to the point that they get blinded to other things in their environment. And then when we compare with um, say the Telexu or the Honored Modders, um, similar things you see um, these groups are, are overly focused on domination and control and, and really malicious ways of getting there. And when we, when we look at the Bene Gesserit, even though sometimes they, you know, they do their own thing, we might not agree with them. We might think they're kind of, you know, working in the shadows. When we put them up against those other groups who are very, very clearly portrayed as negative, I think we, we have to see the Bene Gesserit in a, in a more balanced way as they might not be right all the time, but they, they're they definitely not, not as bad as these other groups. And you touched on that also um, slightly, the, the biographical uh, aspect. So um, we, we talked about that a bit last time you were on the show. W what, what was the influence of, of, um, of Frank Herbert in, to make this, uh, this Ben Jesuit sisterhood and like to, to make them such a powerful force in the gene universe? Yeah, so so my my belief is that um, Herbert had a lot of very strong and influential women in his own life, which not every writer has that translate into their writing, but I think we can see that it did translate into Herbert. So um, his mother had 10 sisters um, who were Catholic and they really wanted Herbert to be raised Catholic and they got their way and um, they helped raise him. And then I think his his spouse Beverly was a very significant influence in his life. So she was also a writer. And one thing that I'm um, looking at in my next book is even though we can't say for certain how much of Beverly is in the Dune series, um, based on Herbert's dedication to her, based on interviews where um, she's interacting with them, I think she had a, a very, very big role in terms of the writing and, and helping him out with the writing and, you know, just talking about ideas and talking about um, female characters, which um, their son Brian talks about. So we can't know for certain, but I think the influence of these women in Herbert's life helped make, helped enable him to make a more realistic and three-dimensional characters um, in the Bene Gesserit, but Jessica especially. I think we can see Jessica being based on Beverly. And one of the interesting points, because you were uh, referring to other science fiction uh, works by uh, by female authors, um, uh, for, for example, Ur Ursula Le, Le Guin. And um, um, so, so do you think part of the reason that that there hasn't been as much attention to, to this was because like Frank Herbert was a, was a male and then potentially they they thought, okay, like because he he's a male, maybe he can't write female characters as, as well. Could that be part of? Uh... Yeah, I think that's that's definitely it. There there are only a couple male writers that are usually considered to have written feminist science fiction, um, and I think they were they were more open and obvious about what they were doing in their writing than Herbert was. Um, and I've tried to find evidence of really any critique of Dune from some of those key writers and I haven't yet found them, but it's an understandable thing to do. But um, I think what what's happened is there's been missed opportunities to look at some of the really influential works um, by male writers and say, just because it's a male writer doesn't mean that we can't find something of value here about the female characters. Um, and science fiction does have a, you know, a bad reputation for either not including female characters at all or making them stereotypes. Um, but I think Dune is a really um, stands out as as quite being different from that. But again, you, you have to you have to pay attention and, and you have to look beyond that surface level. So let's uh, shift gears for, for, for a bit. So, uh, of course, it's it's very relevant that your book has come out right now at this time because we have had the uh, Dune Part One movie from uh, Denis Villeneuve that has just just come out and that's fresh on on everybody's mind. Uh, so yeah, we, we'd be interested to hear about uh, you know like your thoughts on the movie and like potentially connections uh, with the book. So I'll, like I'll go over to you, Sonia, first. Did you enjoy the movie? Were you disappointed? I'm very deeply immersed in the book, right? And the book to me is my first love. Um, I think there was a lot of high hopes for the movie because in part because of what has come before it, um, but also because it got delayed and everything else. 
I think it was a very beautiful movie, but what what I found was some of the themes that really attract me to Dune and some of the things that just can't translate to film, like the dialogue and all of those different kind of layers um, weren't able to make it into the film. And so that's, it's a tension that I feel in terms of wanting to see more of the book and wanting to see more of the, say the political intrigue um, that I find really interesting. And I think the, the format of film is so short, the time is so short, there just isn't room to develop. And so we won't, we don't know what's gonna happen in part two, that gives a little bit more, more space, but um, yeah, it's, it wasn't enough right. time to put all of the best things in the book. The book. Last night, uh, several parts. Um, what was something that you were hoping to see in part one that you didn't get a chance to see you know, from the Benny Jethrit or Jessica or anyone, really. Dinner banquet scene definitely was, um, and I heard that they did film, they did film it, um, but I think that that's an example of when you get to see the interplay between the different groups, right? And you get to see them kind of adjusting and, and, and um, Jessica and Paul do a lot of work in that scene in terms of um, reading other people, seeing where allegiances are, seeing who's a spy, who's not, you know, who, who potentially could help them out if they get in the sticky spot in the future, like all of those, those different subtleties. Um, I mean, I don't know if they were in the, what they filmed, but I was really missing out on the dinner banquet scene. It's such a crucial scene in the book, and I agree with you. The book is the Bible, you know, of the Dune world, and it's something we'll always go back to and that could be just the studio was like this is too complicated people might not get it or they were just like hey we're already making this a long movie let's move forward test audiences we can thank for that one so hopefully we'll get that scene eventually one day you know maybe when dune part two comes out there'll be like a special edition 12k by that time right maybe that's what technology will be uh, what did you think of Jessica overall? I'm conflicted about Jessica. I think there were aspects of her that um, I really liked. I think she she came across as kind of steely, you know, at times. Um, and showing her constantly guiding and, and sometimes chastising Paul aligns very well with the book. You know, even when he thinks he's got a victory, he thinks he's done something right. She's there to say like, no, you didn't quite, you didn't quite get it or you're not quite there. Um, that really, that motherly influence. Um, everything's a teachable moment <laughs> with Jessica, I think um, in the book. Um, uh, one thing, I guess, um, I think, I don't think the audience can get the sense of her large range of abilities. Um, would be a downside. So we see that she can use the voice, we see she can fight, but because we don't have access to her internal thoughts like we do in the book, we don't see that level of her processing literally every detail, analyzing everything. And I thought they also um, added a lot of emotion to her character, which doesn't track very well with the Bene Gesserit. Um, they're quite skeptical of emotions and see them as a weakness. And so she's she's often tearing up or seeming like she's distressed and so i i perhaps that was to humanize her character but um that those didn't quite track well with um with how i think she's portrayed in the book i think we're gonna get more of the jessica book in part two i think that's the fight with stillgard was just like a little hint of what's coming with her hopefully and i i like i always say i and the new we trust but I agree, I think she showed a little bit too much emotion, but in a way it was good because it was also the Benny Jesserit can attack her on that and being like, Jessica, you're messing up. This is not part of the plan. So that's the way I looked at it. Um, I guess a question I just thought when you guys were talking, when you guys were talking about Erlon, who would be your perfect cast as Princess Erlon? I don't know, that's a tricky one. What, what are some options? Give me some options. It's whatever you want. I mean, <laughs> I, I came up with one. My choice was Florence Pugh. Her biggest role, I think, best is in Midsummer. She's the main character. She, she the... plays Black Widow's sister. She's great. <laughs> She's great. Yeah. I think she would be a great mix. I think there's something beautiful about her, but there is that sadness also. 
and feels out of place very much. That's what I was thinking. It needs someone who was able to be really cool and calm, um, but also kind of maybe have a bit of nervousness, right? Because she, she doesn't quite fit in with the Atreides, right? But she's, she, she's also one of those characters that has multiple loyalties, right? She's Benny Gesserit, but she's also part of the Emperor's household. But then she's part of the Atreides household. Um, it's, it's hard to put Frank Herbert's characters in a box, I think. And, and that's part of the beauty of it, but um, in terms of trying to translate to the screen. What would you like to see from part two that, you know, hopefully we get more of the Benny Gesserit? I guess I'd like to see more complexity with the Bene Gesserit. Um, I felt like they they simplified a lot the relationship with Mohayim and Jessica and to seem quite antagonistic. Whereas in the book, it's more of a you know love hate relationship. But she's still she's still giving advice to Jessica and she's still encouraging him or encouraging her to train Paul. So I, I would like to see more more nuance in how the Bene Gesserit function kind of as a, as a player of politics in the Imperium. Um, and I think like her, uh, Mohayim's relationship with the emperor, you know, we don't really see a lot of that in the book, but that's something that they could um, perhaps um, add, add a little bit to in, in a film version. You know, mentioning that, that scene that's not in the book, when she goes and sees the Baron and talks about you know, them attacking. I feel like we're going to get more scenes maybe like that with the Emperor, because so far in part one, the Emperor is just a name. We don't even have a face. We don't have anything. So I'm hoping that is something that we're going to get more of the, the politics, the backstabbing, like the Benny Gesserit's showing like, hey, four of them, these characters are crucial. Like, and we'll talk in a little bit about them in further books, but they are like, it's so interesting because he introduces them slow, slowly on in the beginning and later and later they become such an important part. And I'm hoping that's what Denise doing, kind of like teasing at them and then bringing them on as crucial characters. Yeah, there's in the kind of closing scene of Dune that I really like that, uh, the scene that I analyze where um, Mohayim puts like her like claw, claw like hand on the back of the emperor's throne. And I'm like, how is that not just like the ultimate, like who's really in charge here? Like, you know, she she's the, the power behind the throne. Um, yeah, I, th I thought that was, that's a really, really important scene for, for two characters that we don't see interacting very much, but there's a lot of um, the body language there is, uh, speaks a lot uh, more than words. Uh, in the various interviews, uh, Denise talked about like how one of the priorities for the movie was was writing strong female female characters and um, uh, of course like uh, he he was talking about like you know expanded role for for Jessica but then we also had like Leah Kynes who was male in the book and female in the um, in the movie what were your thoughts about uh, yeah like going beyond Jessica like the portrayal of, of female characters in in the movie it's hard to get a sense of their range um, beyond kind of the the controlling aspects and something that I found interesting is across across all six of the Dune series, except at except at the end when they have the final the, the battle with the honored martyrs, um, Herbert doesn't actually show the Bene Gesserit killing, right? He she shows the men killing, but he doesn't show the Bene Gesserit killing. And so, um, and this this goes back to my point about like what we think of when we think of strength, and I think this is something that Hollywood is still um, still not able to get over is the idea that to be strong you have to be violent and and so kind of showing Jessica kind of as a more violent character um, might might seem like a certain version of strength but I think it, it moves away from the kind of subtle strength that that the Bene Gesserit have in the book um, which possibly you know audiences are not not as not as attuned to because we're we're used to seeing a certain kind of of strength on screen, um, so um, in term and then you know Chani we don't really see a lot more than just kind of you know vision angel Chani um, <laughs> and 
and then even even when we when we do finally get to meet her um, or when Paul gets to meet her at the end, something that they changed uh, from the book was um, she she actually gives them a clue about Jameis in terms of like, the Jameis can fight with both hands, right? So she gives them a really vital clue that helps helps him essentially you know prepare for this um, faint that Jameis has. And if we look at the end of the book. Um, Jessica also gives Paul a clue before he fights Boudratha. And so um, I think my critique would be there's there's one vision of strength, which is, you know, violence and killing and, and control, but there's also other versions of strength. And we we don't get to see a lot of women on screen showing other types of strength. Um, I mean, we do see Jessica having that maternal strength, but I would like to see kind of moving more in different versions of ways that women can be strong and can be influential without having to necessarily, you know, be fighting or be killing or, you know, kind of showing domination in a really physical way. Um, so I, I guess we'll see more of Chani and Chani definitely is a fighter um, in the book, but I'd like to see, I'd like to see more complexity with Jessica. And uh, going to the last point, what, what did you think of the choice to have uh, Chani basically at the beginning do the narration in, instead of Irulan and what, what it was the case in other, other adaptations in the book? I, I, I understand it's really difficult to adapt those the epigraphs and Irulan as a character because um, part, of, part of the role of having those is to really set up Paul as this mythic legendary figure before we even get to meet him. And that that's part of the, the complexity of the book that's hard to translate on screen. Um, so I understand why that was changed. I think um, having, having Chani and the Fremen focus at the beginning is perhaps an attempt to kind of decenter the, the Paul as the hero. Um, but I mean, they should, I guess, well, I was, I find it confusing that they show them harvesting at night, but then, you know, the rest of the movie, they're harvesting during the day because they have to find the sandworms. So it, it seemed like that was a, perhaps like a, a oversight. And, and, and again, like focusing on the Fremen fighting, you know, and, and the explosions and all that kind of thing. Again, it's like, it shifts the focus to that, that kind of like violent attitude. We'll, we'll see how kind of how they translate the Fremen and, and the role in, in the second part. I think that's that's going to be the challenge is you've set them up as this oppressed group who now has, you know, the new oppressors are now living among them. So how are you going to, you know, how is that relationship going to transform into, you know, a more beneficial one? So let's uh, look beyond the, the first book and, and the movie, because of course your, uh, your new book is looking at the whole of uh, Frank Herbert's uh, saga, which is six books. And as we were touching on in the beginning, um, you know, uh, the first book is, is really, really famous, uh, best, best selling science fiction novel, but not everybody has read the, the rest of the series. Uh, so let's start out with the Ben Jesuit th themselves. Uh, how do you see them developing over the course of those, uh, those uh, next six books and uh, spoiler warning in case like people haven't read additional books so we'll, we'll probably go into into more details now. <laughs> I must not fear for fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. Herbert really builds on the skills that he shows in the first book mostly through Jessica um you know some with Mohayam and he, he just expands the range of things that, that they can do, right? So on Dune Messiah, we see more of the political intrigue, see perhaps a more, more malicious side of things because now Paul's outside of their control. And so they kind of just want to, you know, get things back under control and, and don't care so much about the, the human cost of things. Um, and so there's a lot more scheming happening. But in terms of what I'm looking at, in terms of the body, as we move throughout the series, we get more abilities. So um, Herbert mentions when they go to a new planet, they can adjust their circadian rhythm so that they can, you know, just quickly adapt, which would be so great, you know, no jet lag or anything like that. And they they can also, um, yeah, they can, can, he talks more about how they can control their, their weight. And I'm not really sure like what that was about, but um, they can control their aging and 
they can, because one of the characters chooses to be overweight. And so it's kind of a commentary on like, this is how much control we have. Like I can choose what my body shape is. And again, Herbert doesn't go into really any detail about that, but that would be something that would be really interesting to explore in terms of the female body, which is often concerned with weight control and bodily control. And what if you could just, you know, choose what shape your body was at whenever you wanted, you know, um, that's very science fictional. And then by the final books, um, he takes what used to be, um, we see Jessica gaining the, the memories of, of the Fremen, Fremen Reverend Mother and possibly her own, a little bit unclear in the first book, but by the, by the, by the final books, all they have to do is like touch foreheads and then they can transfer their memories um, across each other, what he calls sharing. And so um, it's really an expansion of the kind of psychic abilities and bodily abilities that they have at the beginning. And then all the, probably the, the one that people find most um, shocking is um, he expands more on sexuality in the final books. And um, so the, the honored martyrs are the kind of the bad guys and they, they use sex to enslave men um, and then we find out that the Bene Gesserit, they're not enslaving men, but they like imprint them so that they can control them. So it's, it, things get a little bit crazy in the final books, but, um, but it, we don't really hear too much about any of that in the first few books, right? Like we kind of, like when Yui and Jessica are talking, like we kind of get the sense that like Jessica could kind of make Lido do whatever she wanted, maybe possibly in a sexual way, but it's very, very, very subtle. But by the final books, it's like, this is just kind of one of their methods that they have to, to, to control people. Um, yeah, I don't go into all the details about like why that might be, but I'm really focused on like in terms of the body, but I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting material there if other people wanna, wanna um, study that, that aspect. And as you touched on, like in the, in the first books, you, you don't see much of that overtly. And like uh, a lot of people who haven't read the last books or when they get to them, they're like surprised about like how overt uh, that is. Do you have any theories as to what, why that is? Like, I mean, is it like something that he attended all along or like, is it, was he like, uh, reacting to other things that were going on, like any any thoughts? This is what was happening in the U.S. Like the '70s. Um, I mean, cultural, like cultural kind of revolution and counterculture, and and in science fiction, the new wave. Like there was a lot more opening up um, in society about being able to talk about sexual topics than there had mm -hmm. been previously, um, and in terms of what was happening in the women's movement, there were there was. Um, conflicts and tensions going on between people that saw sex as negative or as a, as a way that women were controlled versus kind of what we, we now see as a sex positive movement or, you know, allowing people to be more free. And then um, there's like religious tension, you know, various religions have restrictions on sexual activity and rates of rates of marriage and what age people were getting married at were changing. And I just, I feel like those kinds of things seeped into the literature. And so when we compare early 1960s with early 1980s, a lot had happened in the US in terms of who can talk about sex, what you can say about it, what science fiction writers are saying about it. And we see that in this kind of the, the conflict between um, how it's used as a tool by women. Um, but I think Herbert's exploring, again, that flipping the usual on its head instead of having it be about, you know, men controlling. It's about, well, what if women, what if women actually were kind of abusing that kind of sexual power? Um, what would that look like? So I'm going to the point about uh, the, the other memory, like I thought one of the points that you were, you connected that with uh, also the, the feminist movement about like how they were like uh, talking about reclaiming the memory of, of their uh, ancestors in a way. Can you elaborate more on that point? I mean, this is a still struggle that's going on, but if we're looking at kind of mid 20th century, I mean, most of what you would read in history books was here's what men were doing, right? Here's wars, here's major events, right? Like very little women involved um, or talked about, you know, except for maybe say, I remember reading about, um, oh, flat, Betty is a flag maker. You know, there's like a couple people that you would read about as like, here, here was a woman that was doing something, you know, and then like back to the, back to the usual. And so part of the, the second wave women's movement was saying, 
hey, wait a minute. We want to know what women have been doing throughout all history. We want to learn about what they were, you know, what was important to them, you know, learn about the community, the family, kind of cultural history. Like it's not, war is not the only thing that is worth remembering. And, and so this is when you see a flourishing of women's studies programs. You see um, women writing about women in literature and history, um, often for the first time, rediscovering, going back to the archives and trying to find. And of course, we don't have a lot of the records because women throughout history have not usually you know, had a chance to be educated and to write. But we do have, there are a lot more than we think. And so they started that process really of reclaiming women's history. And so what I, what I draw a parallel with in the book is, well, isn't it really interesting that Herbert gives us this group of women that are able to tap into you know, the women's line of, of ancestors and they don't need technology to do it. There's no computers involved. There's no hard drives. There's, there's no books even, right? It's just kind of like a mental psychic transfer. Um, and even if that's not particularly realistic, um, it's, it shows us an alternative. What if women could just go back through and see what all the women in their, as their ancestors used to be doing? They don't need to rely on a male historian telling them what happened or telling them what's important. And, and even though Herbert was very skeptical of history, um, he seems to be very positive about the Bene Gesserit's form of history. So just a bit of an inconsistency in, in his kind of like logic, but for me that shows he thought that um, perhaps, you know, women were, were more trustworthy and, or at least the Bene Gesserit were more trustworthy when it came to history than, than the usual narrative accounts that you get. And going to the aspect of uh, sisterhood, so I know that that's, um, you know, it's mentioned earlier in the book that the Avengers are, are referred to as sisters, but the term sisterhood is used more later in, in the series. What's the Im importance of that term and how does it develop over the series? Yeah, so sisterhood um, became a very important term in the women's movement. Um, but again, so Herbert was writing right really before that took off. So. I think he's probably referring to kind of the religious, you know, the religious kind of Catholic notion of sisters and sisterhood. Um, but what I find interesting is there's there's a lot of tension between, you know, in the Bene, Bene Gesserit, you have the organization and, and the order and they, they tell you what to do, right? Like they train you and then you have to kind of follow their rules. And, and then we have in the women's movement, um, the idea of sisterhood was that you know all women have a commonality and all women should be you know part of the sisterhood but quickly as you'll find with any group of people right people start saying well wait a minute like actually i don't have the same experiences as you right like maybe i come from a different culture a different ethnicity a different religion and this idea that we all should get along and we should all follow you know a couple people in charge you know there was that didn't work for everyone, right? And so even within the women's movement, um, you'll see splintering uh, of groups and, and, and divisiveness about, you know, what the, you know, what the policy should be or what, what they should be fighting for. And so I think it's really interesting that Herbert does the same thing in the books. He shows us right from the beginning, right? We see the order told Jessica to have a girl, right? To have girls. And then she didn't. And then, you know, everything kind of launches off from there. And then in, in the real world, you know, some women were told or they kind of agreed, right? Like, oh, we're not going to we're not going to do this particular thing that women have always been told to do because we find it oppressive. And then other women said, well, no, I don't find that oppressive. Like, why, why should I have to follow these rules? Who's making up the rules? And so and that's that's another thing that I think really hasn't been looked at in this is. It's just because you're an individual doesn't mean that you always have to do things just for your individual self, right? Like you can do things that are for the greater good. Or you can be part of something bigger, bigger than yourself, um, which maybe not in our current culture is very popular to think about like others, you know, but I think in the books, the Bene Gesserit, just because they have rules and ask people to follow them doesn't make them evil, right? It makes them a collective that's working towards something. And th that makes me think about the aspect of, uh, of motherhood that you also covered in, in, in detail in, in one of the, the chapters about like how the also in, in reality, there was like the, the tensions about like people trying to like, uh, you, you know, to take away the focus from that, but then like other aspects of feminism were like pulling that as, as a strength. So how did you approach your study of, of motherhood in Dune? 
Yeah, so there's two really influential feminist writers, so I use them as my lens. So um, Adrienne Rich um, wrote about motherhood as a, as a very positive experience, as something that was unique to women and that, you know, was a strength, like, you know, women bear life, you know, women are the only ones who can do this. And, and she had several children. And, and so she said, we should embrace this. We should embrace this as a strength and we should use it as a way of positioning our, ourselves as unique, um, you know, from other people who don't have children. But then on the other hand, um, Shulamith Firestone, you know, and she was, she was very much, um, you know, very heavily criticized for her book where she said, no, actually pregnancy is, is a pain, you know, why would anyone want to get pregnant? You know, we should be trying to outsource pregnancy to technology. So, you know, test two babies, you know, let's take reproduction out of women, you know, out of women. And so we don't have to deal with it anymore. We'll just make it, you know, science can deal with it. And then we won't be discriminated against because we won't have to deal with childcare and raising children and all the burden that usually landed on women. And so I, I, I put those two in tension with each other when I look at the Bene Gesserit, um, because I think, um, especially when Herbert introduces the Bene Talaxu, there, I see them as a vision of, of scientists in control of reproduction. And Herbert is very clear, you know, he's, he's very clear that these are not, these are not good guys. This is not something to be celebrated. You know, they continually bring these goals back to life over and over again, and they tamper with them, but they're only in it for themselves. They're only in it for domination. Whereas the Bene Gesserit, up until the end, the Bene Gesserit say no. They say no to artificial reproduction. They think this should be women controlled. This should be something that is natural and we shouldn't be letting science tamper with it. And so, and I'm not sure why Herbert decided to flip them at the end. I think it's because he wanted to show how desperate things had gotten that, that even women had to turn to science. Um, when things were going south, but um, but that's something I find really interesting um, in terms of, yeah, that tension between motherhood, like is is it a good thing to become a mother and then to have to take care of a child or would it be better if you just, you know, let the Tlaxu kind of give you a gola <laughs> um, over and over again and you can just kind of make modifications to it. Speaking of that subject, um, something that's always been in the back of my mind talking about the further books in messiah the age difference between hate and paul's sister is that disturbing or is that just me <laughs> well see the thing is simon she's not actually the age that her body is right like right. she's already a full-grown woman when she's born <laughs> i'm just curious to know how audience are going to deal with that one well i think they'll have to up age alia if they're going to have her as a as a character because the two-year-old um Full grown person doesn't really make sense. Yeah. And that's something going back to the movie talk that I'm like, huh, I wonder if they're going to magically make her like morph and get older all of a sudden in part two and be like, here you go. She's born and now she's 12. Herbert was very interested in reproduction and kind of like you can, you can be mentally different. You know, your, your mind might not match the body that you're in. Um, yeah. which is, I mean, that's a common science fiction theme, but I think he, yeah, he, he kind of adds that psychic angle of like, what happens if you already knew all this stuff and you're kind of trapped in this like younger body that's now going through puberty, like that kind of sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting when you talk about it, about how, you know, some of the studies have been uh, dismissive or not in, including Dune, what, for example, when they talked about like the new wave of science fiction, but the, you know, when, when he, you stand back and look at all the different areas he explored. He, you know, he really, you know, pushed the envelope on a, on a lot of uh, different topics. <laughs> but again, I, he's not super obvious with it, right? Like you, they kind of give you some information and you have to piece it together. He really liked to make his readers work work for the messages, and not everyone likes to work hard. Um, so, um, but yeah, I think I think rereading is really helpful. When you reread the Dune series, you pick up on things that you didn't get the first time. Yeah, and, and we, we were mentioning earlier, like so even even people who have read more of the books, uh, a lot of people haven't read those, you know, the fifth and, and sixth uh, books. Like, how how important from your perspective are they to the to the overall narrative? Like, um, when it comes to the to the Bene Gesserit and like overall wrapping up the the story and messages that you think Frank was going for. 
we don't get to see a lot of the inner workings of the Bene Gesserit until those final books. And so um, he, he gives us more insight into how they, how they made decisions and kind of their counsels. And, and I found it really interesting that we see these kind of like war councils that are all made up of women, except maybe Miles Tegg, you know, their, their military commander. And it's, you know, women talking about strategy and talking about, you know, oh, should we get rid of the scola or, you know, or this or that. And the kind of the scene that we're used to seeing, you know, men in a war room making decisions, it's a Bene Gesserit. And then talking about um, their, again, like any group, there, there'll be people that disagree with each other. And so they're kind of trying to work out. I mean, it's not necessarily a democratic system, but I think it's, it's, it's less hierarchical than, than perhaps other groups. Um, I don't, it's not necessarily essential to the story um, because he, he moves away from the Atreides storyline in those final books, um, which was also interesting because we've had Paul and Leto have really been dominant male characters in the first four. And then suddenly it's like, oh, well, yeah, the Atreides, you know, they can't kind of used to be a thing, but um, he, he doesn't focus on that kind of monarchy or dynasty so much. Like there are still Atreides characters like um, Shiana, but it's like the distant past. And really the only importance about the Atreides is the genetic, the genetic kind of material um, at that point. And unfortunately he didn't get to finish the last one. So he leaves us on a cliffhanger. We're not really hundred percent sure what he was planning um, on looking at, but um, it's, it's, yeah, he, he gives us more information about here's how groups of women might work with each other and here's some of the, the pitfalls, right? And then also if we think about the spice, right? Like having artificial spice then kind of disrupts that precious resource. Um, and so there's just, there's a lot of politics shifting in those final books, but we don't really get to see the final outcome, unfortunately. And then um, I guess to, to, to wrap up that, that part of the discussion, when you look at, um, you've talked about uh, Dune like in the historical context and uh, explored a lot of the uh, aspects of the um, uh, women's uh, bodies and being in, in control. Like how, how would you see that that ties into contemporary discussions on, on related topics? Yeah, so women are still fighting for bodily control <laughs> in the 21st century. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really... I think it really shows that Herbert was tapping into something that resonated then, resonates now, um, and, and, and really ties in, I mean, we can see with COVID as well, the idea of the, the individual choice, individual freedom over your own person versus the collective and versus what maybe society says or what religion says or you know, what's best for the whole group maybe isn't best for the individual or vice versa. And, and I, th I think we still haven't as a society, at least in the West, reconciled or figured out how do we deal with this? Because a lot of our traditions are very individualistic or they really push, they push this idea of the individual should be able to do what they want. But then to live in a society with rules and laws you, you regulate, you take some, some of that ability for the individual to do whatever they want away. And where's the line? Where, where's the line between your individual rights and, and the societal um, and pressures? And, and yeah, and, and unfortunately it still, it still ends up on, on largely women's bodies in terms of like, and also because of reproduction, like what women should be able to do, what they shouldn't be able to do, you know, and even though we've had a lot of loosening up of, of norms around sexuality, there's still a lot of the same stereotypes and baggage have followed us through the decades and, and, and bodies are not treated the same. So I think it's still very relevant. And, and part of why I think this book stands the test of time is because rather than focusing on kind of gadgets or super fantastical abilities, Herbert gives women Really what they wanted which is just like the basics like you can just control your body you know like wouldn't that be great um and so I, I hope people can can really see see that he he gives us something to work with that we still don't have um in in society today 
Yeah, he, he was definitely ahead of his time in, in so many aspects. It's just amazing when you go back to the book, you know, like uh, I've gone, you know, I've read it like decades ago and I go back to it now and like it's always like speaking to something that, that, that's going on in, in the world. It boggles my mind how many people stop at one point, I think after God or Emperor or before God Emperor and they're like, okay, cool, I'm done. Is it because they heard something or they just like perverted out? <laughs> I don't know. Like if anyone's listening to this or watching it, and you've only stopped, please leave a comment or email the show and let us know. Like, I'm curious. Like, when I found out there was more, because, you know, growing up, I was like, oh, the Lynch movie, that's the thin, the book. Wait, there's more books? So I can go on more in this journey? Oh, wait, it gets really dark and messed up. I love it even more now. But yeah, I'm so curious why people stop. It's so interesting. To be fair, God Emperor... I think is a love or hate it. I mean, it's it's a lot denser um, in terms of the if you if you're expecting kind of the the hero journey, um, God Emperor kind of like stops you in your tracks. So it's possible people are like, oh, I don't want to read more of this type of book. But but the, I think the final two books are more like the earlier books in terms of they have a storyline and they have kind of an arc. I actually held off on reading Chapter House because when I when I first read the series because I didn't want it to end. So I actually like saved it as a as a precious final six book because I knew there was no more. Kara, when, when you were doing your study or just like in general, did you look at all at the expanded uh, literature by uh, Brian Herbert and Kevin G. Anderson? Did you like uh, take anything at, at all from that? No, I, I stuck with the original because, well, first of all, six books is still really <laughs> a lot of material to cover and I wasn't able, able to cover that, but um. I mean, that is older, and so it's 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 kind of I guess easier in, in terms of academia to consider it as literature versus kind of what's coming out now. Generally, is, is stuff is not usually studied when it's fresh, um, comes out uh, later, and of course, like the the expanded stuff. Is, is not the same as Herbert's, right? It's set in the same universe, but it doesn't necessarily have all of the layers and the depths and things. And then there's also additions that perhaps contradict things um, in the original. So yeah, I've just stuck to the original just to keep it simple. And also it's still a lot of material. One final question. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Ryan Holiday, anytime he interviews authors, he's always asking them, what are you reading? What do you read when you're not writing? Uh, at the moment, I'm reading like nonfiction, academic literature. Um, but I did, I did, I have been trying to read some more science fiction. So I did, have read some um, Ursula Le Guin and Kim Stanley Robinson earlier this year. But well, I don't get a lot of time to read for pleasure because I'm usually I'm usually reading research material. Um, but it's definitely always good to to take a break from that. So. What are you guys reading? Yes, so I mean, to, to me, to be honest, it's been like all Dune recently because, of course, because of running the, the site, I received re review copies of, you know, like for example, like the uh, Duke of Caledon, Lady of Caledon. So that's why I, I've been getting my first, uh, uh, I guess, uh, experience into the expanded uh, universe recently. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's been about it. Like I think, but like you, because of doing a lot of work related to that, I haven't had a chance to read a lot outside in the in the past year. <laughs> I've been mostly, these are super boring for people. Uh, I've been reading a lot of Robert Greene books and I've been going back and reading Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, so to, to wrap up, uh, before we go, uh, Kara, like, uh, first of all, th thanks a lot for, for coming on the, on the show at the, at the end of the year. I wanted to uh, give you a chance to talk about like what's coming next. I know you're w working on a, another book. Yeah, so I'm working, working on another book on Dune. Um, so this is this is going to be more of, of a general, like covering the first book. So more of a general guide to Dune. And I'm trying my best to make it um, not too academic so that it's accessible to like more general audience, um, even though it will have it will have depth and complexity. Um, so like this one, I'm having to choose five kind of chapters and so which is five main themes to focus on. And so it's supposed to be the major, the major themes or the major themes I think are, are most important for people studying Dune. 
Um, so things like you know, ecology and environmentalism and like the psychology. And so that that one should be out next year. This will that will be a shorter book. So this it's designed to be about a third the size of the, um, the other book. So just more of kind of a, a, a quick dive into Dune. And then also it will be relating it to um, cont more contemporary issues. So why should we still read Dune today? You know, wh why should we care about the ecological message? How is that relevant today? Um, so the, the challenge is trying not to overly date it by talking about specific things happening in 2021. Um, so I'm trying to kind of make it more general, more general themes so that, you know, in 10 years, hopefully we're not still talking about COVID. Um, but yeah, more of the general themes. Um, so that, and that it's designed to be kind of for students studying at a university, but again, also kind of someone who's read the book, you know, they're never going to take a class on it or really read about it in, in extended detail, but it, it will be something that they can help unpack. Let's say, let's help unpack Herbert's um, many layers, um, which seem obvious kind of once you've been studying it for a while, but then when you talk to people that, you know, it's like, oh yeah, Herbert hid that. So no wonder like people, you know, need, need some encouragement to kind of see those themes. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's the benefit for people with this book. And then I have some articles coming out about the Bene Gesserit and some edited collections as well. And in terms of the, the second book, is, is that also gonna have material from the, the whole saga or is it focusing on the first no, book? No, this will just be the first book. Again, because most people, if they're studying Dune at a university, they'll just read the first book. Yeah. Um, and also general readership often, and, and the first book can stand alone. So this is yeah. kind of, it's part of a series of um, classics of science fiction. So why should we consider doing a classic? Oh, we'll, we'll definitely uh, keep everybody up to date once once that comes out as, as well. I'm looking forward to that one as well. Um, so wh where, where can people find uh, your uh, more about your, your work, your, your articles, presence on social media, all that? Oh, yeah. Best place is my website, duneschiller.com. And the information about the book is on the publications page. And so there's a video to uh, the virtual book launch. If you want to hear me talking more about it, different way. Um, and then also links um, to purchase. Simon, where can people find you? Um, social media, first uh, initial S for Simon, and then my last name, Dowdy. This is uh, Marcus Gabriel. So uh, we have a lot planned for 2022. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are, there's going to be a lot coming, whether it's the, the books, uh, comics, uh, movies. So we have the, the countdown for the next uh, two years. Uh, so we're going to have a lot more uh, uh, interviews, uh, deep dives, coverage of all the, the latest news uh, here on Dune Talk and on dunewsnet.com. So this is uh, your editor in chief. You can find me at dunewsnet on uh, Twitter and Instagram and on dunewsnet.com. Uh, thanks, everybody, and talk to you next week. We hope you've enjoyed Dune Talk. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you know when the next episode drops. Stay tuned to dunenewsnet.com and add us to your social feeds. Be the first to hear breaking news and reviews.